And that is going to be done by none other but our Royal Heritage, uh, this Royal Heritage Zolani Mkiva of Gokswa village in Gokswa. His Royal Heritage Zolani is a general secretary of the Congress of Traditional Leaders of South Africa, Contra Lessa, that's how it is called. He was elected on a post in December, 2017 for more than 15 years Prior to his overwhelming election as the General Secretary, he had served in the National Executive Committee of Contralesa, occupying senior leadership positions, including head of the presidency, the National Executive Director and National Organizer, respectively. He is also the President and Director General of the Institute of African Royalty, IAR, a continental body that coordinates initiatives of African traditional and cultural leaders. Bulani is also the reigning Chief Executive Officer of the Sforza Royal, I wish I could say, Sforza Royal Council, which looks after the interests of His Majesty King Zulu. <laughs> or should I toss Lolizwe Sikau and the entire Stosa royal family. He's a poet and laureate in South Africa. He's very, very well known uh, worldwide as a poet, a unique one as such. And we are very happy to welcome uh, Chief Zolani today to join us. Hi, your royal majesty, how are you? You're welcome. Please unmute yourself. Uh, thank you very thank much, you so uh, much, my beautiful Queen, Your Majesty. I want to take this opportunity first and foremost to greet you in your capacity as the facilitator of this session and also uh, take uh, this particular uh, moment to pay my respect and honor to the wonderful host, uh, the brilliant Dr. Wale. Idris for ensuring that we do find uh, this opportunity to address uh, this very important international conference to discuss a matter that is at the center of uh, Africa's uh, administration in so far as customs, rituals, as well as traditions that are not progressive, uh, rituals that are not only primitive, but they are outdated and they don't talk to what we expect as uh, people who uphold uh, the spirit of Ubuntu amongst other things. I have not prepared a paper as it were, but uh, what I did was to just uh, to talk through uh, very pertinent matters that relate to this and also the fact that uh, some of my colleagues um, who preceded uh, my talk have also spoken to some of the items that I had hoped that I was going to talk to. And my role, therefore, will just be to emphasize the point, because what is important in this respect is that we speak um, from one angle, we sing from one verse, from one hymn book with oneness in terms of uh, the melody that we are talking about on this matter. Firstly, I think we, we are duty bound uh, to unite as Africans in general, but as African leaders, both in the continent as well as in the diaspora uh, against uh, all forms of customs, rituals, and tradition that are hurting on the part of our people. We cannot claim to be upholding the values and norms of the spirit of Ubuntu 
and then we contract it ourselves by way of practicing rituals that are hurting women, that are hurting children, uh, that are not developmental in any way, and that do not even find an expression in terms of the scientific discourse. So both from a scientific discourse as well as from a spiritual discourse, these uh, rituals as customs and traditions, from where I'm sitting, I think we need to do with them as soon as possible. We do not need to wait for policy measures to be put in place. We do not need to wait for laws to be enacted in our respective countries. But this is a decision that we can take uh, with immediate effect because these rituals are self-serving. And these rituals are actually misrepresenting and misapplying our cultural outlook as Africans. No one would be able to convince me to say that uh, the female genital mutilation uh, is something that is relevant and it is helpful uh, to society and it makes women to behave in a particular way. For me, the, the female genital mutilation is a violation of a human right, is a violation of a women's right, but most importantly, what it does, it terrorize and brutalize children and women. And it is for that reason that I'm saying that it needs to be repealed. And I think the Africans with their sovereignty, they must use their authority. They must use their authority, which is their best authority, which is their sovereignty, which is the supreme, um, the, the supreme authority that uh, is able to make them to take a decision without necessarily processing any particular uh, a process of a lawmaking. Because if something is hurtful, it therefore becomes not only un-African, it becomes anti-African. And I think Africans should lead by example in demonstrating to the world that uh, we are people who uphold uh, human, humane, humaneness, humanism, and humanity. And humanity that does not terrorize, brutalize, and that does not inflict pain. Because there's no point for us to take measures that are artificial and, uh, and, and make them as if it's a natural thing to occur. Well, many people will argue that these are time-tested measures which have been used in the past. I think we must agree that uh, in the majority of cases, our culture is very brilliant and is very healthy and uh, it is very progressive. But there are just few uh, isolated things that we need to isolate completely, which are hurting our people. Once a ritual begins to hurt people, once a ritual begins to kill people, once a ritual begins to frustrate the livelihood of the people, that ritual ceases to be a ritual that should be respected by a people. It's either that ritual needs to be transformed completely, it's either that ritual needs to be done away with. So in that context, I believe that we need to do away with this. The second aspect is the issue of a, a short term marriages, as well as child marriage. Um, I think all of these, with where we are as humanity, are things that we ought to review because they sort of uh, entrench in the minds and the hearts of our people the sense of what is called patriarchy. And I want to talk about patriarchy because in terms of the African culture, we're not patriarchists. We have a role for women, we have a role for women, for men. And we always harmonize the role for men and the role for women in society. The division of labor becomes the key fundamental feature of the different roles that are played by men and women. And the role played by women and men in society is a role that complement each other. 
it does not create a conflict or a division because all of us who are working towards the same direction. Therefore, we must all agree that uh, short-term marriages as well as child uh, marriages are things that should be the things of the past. I think we need to have a benchmark that says a lady or a young woman must be allowed to mature at least to the minimal level of the world standard or the international standard. I know that other people will ask whose standards are those. I think we're part of that conversation. In many of our African states, we have already agreed that the threshold should be the age of 18 uh, for a woman to consent. And I think if we start maybe there uh, as the entry level for women to be allowed to agree or disagree, to consent uh, uh, into marriage. But parents uh, in this day and age cannot just unilaterally uh, be part uh, of forcing children to get into marriage uh, before they reach a particular level of uh, minimum maturity. Um, otherwise, you would be setting up your own children for a rough uh, road ahead of them in terms of their future. And you would make them to regret for the rest of their lives. When your child finds herself in a particular union, 30 years into her time, and she believes that a decision was taken for her when she was only 18. And at that time, she has already spent 10 years into that marriage and she regrets that she was forced into a union, which ordinarily, if she was to take her own decision about it, she would not have approved of her being put into that equation. Then it becomes an abomination for the parents because what if that child commits suicide because of that arrangement? And we live in an era and we live at a time of the new millennium when children are so vulnerable and it is so easy for them to take their lives on the basis of something that frustrates them. We must uh, appreciate that times have changed. We must appreciate that uh, the environment in the world has changed. The influence of the social media, the influence of the television, the influence of the radio in our lives, and the, in the influence of all types of social media intervention from Instagram to Facebook to Twitter, it gives our children a broad and a wide scope of them to listen to different things that are happening in society. And we can't ignore that. We can't take that for granted. Whether we like it or not, it is a fact and a reality that faces us on a daily basis. I am not saying that we must negate our culture. It is important, as we say these things, that uh, there are interventions that need to be made. It is important side by side to actually firm our stand so that our culture is also foregrounded in the process. All I am saying is that out of our culture, let's remove the negatives out of our tradition. Let's remove the negatives out of our customs. Let's remove the negatives. No one can articulate, uh, no one can be a prota protagonist of negativity in our culture. Our culture must portray us as a people, as a good people. Our culture must be the mirror of the who we are from a point of view of our DNA, from a point of view of our identity. We are a good people as Africans. We are people with a good soul. We are people who are known for that African spirituality which embodies the spirit of humanity at large. It is that spirit that actually made us victims of colonization because we are loving, we are peace-loving people, we are embracing, we embraced our colonialists without us knowing that we're embracing people who are to attack us. But we must never move away from that spirit of embracing humanity. Even though 
that were caught up and we became victims of those who were uh, greedy, uh, of those who wanted to take away our land and our wealth. But from a point of view of human touch, we must remain at our best. Let the world come to us to benchmark on the goodness of African culture. Let the world come to us to benchmark on the greatness of our African spirituality, of the greatness of our souls as a people. So for me, I've listened to, to, to the kings, I've listened to the queens, and I think all of us were speaking from one voice on why we need to do away uh, with female genital mutilation, as well as uh, child uh, marriages and short-term marriages. I think we must be in agreement that things like short-term marriages can easily be equated to human trafficking. I can tell you now, and I speak on this with authority, if once you have a, a middleman who are trading young girls to people who fly in in the country in order to marry African girls for two weeks so that they come and have fun during holiday. For me, that is equal to human trafficking. Deal with that immediately. And in fact, it points to criminality. Those are criminals, arrest them. Immediately put them behind bias. Because you can't tell me that people are going to sell their children for two weeks so that the tycoons that come from elsewhere in the world must come and stay in a holiday home with, your, with a 17 year old and they victimize that girl for a period of two weeks and then they fly out, they leave that girl. Of course, the parents will have huge reserves of money which they have never thought of. I think money is not greater than our human uh, spirit. It's not greater but than humanity. Once we, we stop using our brains, we think with money, then there's something wrong with us. There's definitely something wrong with us. You can't sell your child simply because you want to make money, simply because you want to change your life for the better, you sell your child. Where is your soul? It means you are no longer African in terms of your heart. You are no longer African in terms of your thought process. So we can't place the love of money over the love of humanity. I think what is fundamental uh, for us as Africans should be our love for humanity more than the love for money. I think we must take money as a means of consolidating human development, but it must not be the basis from which we employ our thinking. Money must be used as a convenience to consolidate our human development. But what is important, which should be at the center of humanity is human development itself. I think with those few words, my queen and uh, fellow guests, on this panel, I am emphasizing a point that the outlook of our culture is for us to cleanse, to cleanse our culture of any negativity, of anything that is inflicting pain in women, in children, and even in our society. Because once you inflict pain on women and children, it cascades into violence into society. All of that, you brutalize women, for their entire uh, lifetime. So we need to stop this. It is un-African and it is anti-African. With those few words, that would be uh, my contribution into this very important uh, journey that we are taking. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, Chief Zulani. Um, definitely our culture should identify us. And, and yes, as Africans, we are good people. It's, uh, it's, it, that is exactly who we are. Uh, our, actions, uh, our actions must be uh, not, not disastrous. Um, we can do some things that are actually affect the lives of people, especially children. And, and, and in some instances, you even mentioned that we could even uh, cause some people or the death of some people. So are we here to mend and heal or we are here to mend and kill? This is something we have to think about. 
So thank you very much for very, your very thoughtful uh, presentation. Uh, we will move uh, very quickly. Uh, we, at a point in time, we were ahead of the time, but now we have gone into the time uh, a bit. So it's, it's a bit uh, a concerned. So we may have to look at uh, uh, when we are speaking quickly. I um, want to move on to the sixth region of Africa, and that is the, the diaspora, a very, very important part of, of uh, our world. And that is where this amazing, amazing queen is coming from, originally from the Democratic Republic of Congo. She has been everywhere. She has lived uh, in, in other countries, including uh, Brazil. Queen Dayambi Kabatusula was crowned as the ruler of the Bena Tashiamba people of Bakwa, Hindu of Central Kasai region, part of the ancient Lumba Empire in the Democratic Republic of Congo. She holds the title of Diambi Mukalenga, Mukaji, Wa Nkanshama, Wa Bakwa, Luntu. Wow, that's heavy. That's amazing. That, that gives a weight to this amazing woman that we are going to listen to. Uh, she's the author of the Leopard of the Bakwa Luntu people. She's also the Grand Maidu Povo Bantu Brasileiro, also the queen of African descendants of Brazil. My queen, how are you? You are most welcome to today's program. We are listening to you as you bring us greetings from the diaspora and to share your thoughts on the issues that we are discussing today and what we can do to move this agenda forward. You're welcome, the floor is yours, my queen. Greetings, greetings everyone on the behalf of my people of the Congo, the Bakwaluntu people of Kasai belonging to the uh, uh, Luba uh, group, the big Luba group, also on the behalf of uh, the African descendants of Brazil and everywhere else in the world. I am Queen Diambika Batuswila Chiyomwata Mukalinga Mukajiwa Nkashama. That means I'm the female king of the Lutu people. So I sit on the throne as a, as a king. And also, Grande Mai do Povo Bantu Brasileiro, I was crowned two years ago in Salvador de Bahia to represent the traditional uh, power of the African descendants of Brazil, who are 90 million as of today. And of course, I do a lot of work in the diaspora to uh, unite the diaspora together and also to create uh, bridges between the children of the diaspora who are 350 million people to the continent uh, and so that we can restore and heal our identity. I want to greet uh, all the uh, majesty, royal highnesses that are here present, the kings, the queens, the queen, queen mothers, the princesses and the princes of course, and every uh, excellency that is here and also all protocol respected to every guest or every person that is watching today. So I'm very, very happy to be here with you talking about this specific issue and of course, I will align uh, like my brothers to everyone here. And as also the uh, foreign secretary of the Pan-African Council of um, Traditional and Customary Authorities, I'm also there to tell you that many, many kings are aligning themselves with what I will be expressing today. So first of all, every, any crime has to be qualified as a crime is a crime, it has to be judged as a crime. Just like the prince was just saying preceding uh, me, anything that has to do with abusing children, abusing women, hurting women physically, hurting children, or hurting anybody should be falling into the same category and should be legislated by our states, normally that are already have those laws into the, into the constitutions and uh, into the, the laws of the land. But also the, uh, the traditional leaders, of course, have to emphasize on what is right. But first and foremost, we have to, we cannot have this discussion without not mentioning the history. First of all, many traditions were not tradition once. Once they were not even known to any, anybody and once they were not practiced anywhere. Before becoming a tradition, it's first a novelty. Any practice is a novelty first. And then eventually, if it serves the community, if it serves the people, 
if it serves humanity, then we can consider it a tradition because we keep repeating it over the, the, the generation from generation because we feel it's serving. But when a practice is no longer serving the people, there is no king or queen here or princess or prince here will, that will tell us that, no, we have no right to change anything. Every tradition, every belief can be amended so long as we have new knowledge about what is it that we are doing and how, how harmful it is to the people and to the community. The second thing I want to stress upon, and those are very, those are fundamental African principle from thousands of years, not just yesterday. The second thing I also want to stress is that we have to know our history. A lot of those practices that we call traditions today are not originating from Africa. Let's not forget that Africa lost historical initiative over 3000 years ago when we were invaded by the Assyrian first, the Persian next, the Greeks after, the Romans, and then later on the Turks and many more people that came into Africa with tremendous influence on our people and on our cultures. Many of our own practices have been replaced in some instances with practices that comes from other people, other culture, other religions that are not indigenous to Africa. And we are talking really a lot about the, the um, uh, female excision. And I want to just show you this, uh, if I don't know if you're gonna be able to see this, this is a book, okay? And the title is Female Excision is Eur Eurasian Origin. So there have been a lot of research done and I will of course pass the information to the floor after to pass the information down. So women, uh, the excision of the clitoris of women is not an African practice. It's a practice that comes from the far uh, uh, lands of, of Europe and especially the Eurasian steppes and have infiltrated the continent through religion, but also through slavery. So without talking about slavery and the history of slavery in our country, in our, in our continent for over 800 years, we will not always understand why is it that we practice some things that seem to be today, of course, barbarian and, uh, and, and inappropriate and hurtful. Let's not forget that when we had the, the slave trade from the east of the continent, from the Arab lands, they also mutilated men and women. They castrated men and they mutilated men, women. So, and that was a way to control the, the people and the slaves. Let's not forget that during the Atlantic slave trades, what, the, what we used to mutilate ourselves in order not to be sold, because once we had mutilation and physical defects, we were not to be traded in the slave trade. So we have to also, with this work, do a, a thorough analysis of where some of these most harmful practice come from. And I guarantee you, as Prince was just saying before me, that many of these uh, inhumane practice are not indigenous to Africa. So we have to make sure that we get educated, that we do a lot of research to emphasize the fact that Africans have always been the people who supported the Ma'at. Ma'at is all the principle of, of wisdom and of love and compassion and Ubuntu. So in those practices, it's forbidden, it's inhibited to hurt somebody. So hurting a woman is, is a sacrilege in every African culture. So if we have inherited practices that we included later on in our traditions and so-called traditions today, it is a good time to remember where we got them from, to ask the historians to do a thorough research and, 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 and a thorough analysis of where this information and where these practices started on the continent. And then to go and seek and make sure that this information is public because the Africans are now wearing a stigma, for instance, of the ablation, ablation, ablation of the clitoris or clitoridectomy as it's like our own invention when it is not. Egypt did practice some form of excision, but it was not the ablation of the clitoris. It was a tiny ritual and symbolic incision like the, we're doing the circumcision for the men, the girls, once they had the rites of passage, had to also have a symbolic uh, a, a circumcision. 
to show that they were choosing to be a female rather than to be a man. Because from the beginning, our belief, we believe God make, make only one being that was men and women and separated them. So the ritual of taking oath and taking personal engagement, free choice of choosing, that's the symbol of that ritual. But it was a minute symbolic um, excision that was very, very limited back over past 3000 years ago. So the ablation and the mutilation and the sewing, the women after they give birth, it's something that is not of our practices. So we have to combat them with force because in reality, they are not part of our indigenous traditions. Now, when we talk about the children marrying young children and especially young girls, we have not to forget that when these practices were uh, adopted, the, the life expectation of most African women were might maybe 25 to 30 years old. So if the childbearing ages were only 10 years, you know, it would be making sense at the time that you would marry early on as soon as you were, you had reached your puberty. And that was not just an African practice. That's a practice everywhere else in the world. Before we understood how to, to prolong life, now we live till 75 years old. Of course, we do not have to be married at 13 or 14. And today in the, the new culture that we have now and the new understanding, we have the option of not having to marry our children because now they are legally children until they are 18. In the past, maybe they were no longer children by the time they reached the puberty. And once the girl reached her first menstrual, then she was now considered a woman. And they had rites of passage for all of that. But it's no longer the case. So I agree with everybody that those practices have to be uh, reconsidered. However, we cannot talk about these practices if we don't also talk about the economic context. Many, many of these practices continue because the girls are a burden, financial burden to the families that cannot take care of them. Most of these things are in regions where there is high poverty or villages where there is high poverty. You will not find a wealthy king who wants to marry his daughter when she's 13. That's not, that's a nonsense. In our history, it could have been the case back then because of the reason that I mentioned of life expectancy and childbearing ages, but today, when women don't have, don't, African women don't reach the menopause until 50, we don't need to do this anymore. So I, I, I absolutely align myself with everybody who spoke harshly about this. We have also to address the economic situation that makes the child trafficking, like Prince Solani was saying, the child trafficking of selling your child for sexual favors so that you can gain money. This is a poverty problem, and we will not resolve it just if the kings say, speak against it, the government speak against it. We will also, we will succeed to abolish those practices when we give our people a better life you know, prospect in terms of providing for their needs and providing for the needs of their children, and especially for girls. Now let's talk about the role of women, the gender equality or gender problems. That is no, not either an African problem. Whoever would say that it's an African problem is a liar. It doesn't come from Africa. When the Europeans, when the, the everybody invaded Africa, especially the Greeks, in their own land, women were not even considered as object. Even in the Christian church, Catholics didn't consider women to have a soul until at least 600 years into Christianity and into Catholic church. So Europeans are the ones who never consider women. We are not the one who never consider women. We've always have women and on the throne. We've always have women had women on the leadership position in all our communities. We have great kings like Achep Sut, who is, was a pharaoh of Egypt and ruled and did amazing things. I can cite Queen Zinga of Angola, Congo, who was also a brilliant queen who ruled. Many other queens in the community. We have women chiefs everywhere in Africa. So when the European comes to Africa with the imposition of their religion and imposition of other religion, foreign religion, uh, they change the rules of engagement. They change the governance system and the value system of African people. But that was not a choice. That was by force. 
But now that we are recovering our memory, now we are recovering the truth. It is our role to speak the truth because we have been lied to for thousands of years almost. We have been lied to for hundreds of years. Our history has been told to us by our invaders, by those who oppressed. Now it's time that we take a stand as African people to restore our dignity because our cultures, the civilization that came out of this land, like Kemet and many more before Kemet and many more after Kemet were civilization that came with the first human right bill. The Mandate Charter was the first human right bill and that included the rights of women just like anybody else in, as any other individual. So it is time that Africa refused the labels and Africa become more educated about herself, her own history, her own past, her own culture, her own value, and we push away now, who are they to tell us that we don't have equal rights here when the last, the, the, the woman in Switzerland was capable of voting only in, two, in, in 1971? We've had how many women president in Africa compared to everywhere else in the world? How many women prime minister? How many women are, lead, are holding roles of power in Africa, despite the fact that we were superimposed a culture that is not ours? Our traditional culture is still transpiring because we are ready to take the challenge. So I am very, very honored to, to be there with all of you, all my kings and queens, and I urge you to unite. I hear there's a lot of different communities and different you know, people. We have to find a way to get together. We have to find a way to pull together, regardless of our differences, regardless of the religion, regardless of the language, and we have to unite because only when we are strong together, we will overcome all of these maladies, all these symptoms of the brutality of the treatment we have endured, of, uh, of uh, adopting or of taking in maladaptive behaviors, meaning behaviors that do not serve us and do not serve the good of the community. And we have to be very careful not to look at others as those who are the one who set the example for us. They came to Africa, they took everything we had and they built their civilization on top of the heritage of our ancestors. So we have to be courageous enough to go fetch that heritage, to study the Mahat, to study the laws of our ancients, to study the, the, the real customs of Africa and to understand their meaning and to see how we can adopt them. And if there are some that are no longer valid, that are maladaptive for today's uh, era, we have to take them out, boot them out and make new tradition. Like I said at the very beginning, before anything becomes a tradition, it's a novelty first. There is a one, a first day where we do something and then it becomes a tradition with time and with generation. So we can still adopt new traditions today or new things today that will one day become tradition for our children and our grandchildren. But we have to be strong, we have to be firm and we have to, to keep our head up and not take on anything that they tell us that we are anymore. That time is over. Thank you so much for inviting me, my dear Queen Obapa. I, I really appreciate you. I value all the work that you do. And I know I have a lot of my brothers and sisters here who are doing a tremendous job. Thank you so much. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, Queen Diambi. Thank you so much, my queen. I mean, the issue of research has come in again and again, and you have also hammered that. I remember Professor Thru spoke about the need for us to research. You have also mentioned that. So this is something that we have to take along as we go into our new steps. And, and, and you have mentioned also that some of these practices were, were inherited from, you know, many years ago forever. And now that we have realized that we have inherited it, now the conversation is thickened. What do we do? The way forward is what we need to now talk about. And you have spoken about coming together unite, as a united front. I, I love your passion and I, 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 I can listen to you for hours on end, my queen. Thank you very much. Thank you so much 
for, for your presentation and we will take note of all the key, key points, the nuggets that you have put out there for us. And we'll put it together and work with it as we move on together. So your majesties, royal highnesses, uh, we are moving on very gradually. We are almost towards the end part of our conversation. And now that we are done with the representations from the uh, African regions, we will move on to talk briefly, very briefly, have a conversation between two of our Ackling Queen Mothers, one in Ghana, one in Cameroon, to talk about the role of cultural leaders in ending harmful traditional practices. But we want to emphasize on leadership. What kind of leadership are our queens bringing to this uh, role? What kind of leadership are we working with our kings, our chiefs to bring to these roles? What are we doing in our steps? What have we done? And what are we looking forward to? I'm going to introduce an amazing sister, friend, partner, buddy, everything put together of mine, who has been in this boat with us for so many years. She, she wears so many hearts, but today she is here in her capacity as the queen mother. Honorable Mama Abla Jifa Gomashi, she's the development queen mother of a plowed traditional area in charge of protocol. Honorable Jifa is a veteran actress, producer, writer, poet, entrepreneur, and politician. She has served as a former deputy minister of tourism, culture, and creative arts in Ghana. She is currently a member of the Parliament of Ghana, representing K2 South in the water region. And I must say, I must say that K2 South had its first female MP to rise to the occasion. She got the uh, uh, area has. She's the founder of Values for Life, is an NGO uh, that provides various social services improving children, youth, and women in Ghana. She has produced, directed, and narrated many Ghanaian television culture programs, such as By the Fireside. She serves as the country representative for the continental African Queens and Women Culture Leaders Network. My friend, my partner, my everything, Honorable Jifa Gomashi is going to be the moderator, and she's going to have a conversation with my admirable Queen Janet Kim. Queen Janet is an ardent human rights strategist and an advocate with a sharp focus on women empowerment, gender and juvenile justice. She has more than 25 years of dedicated service to women and girls, working with different organizations at global, regional, national, and local levels. She has demonstrated a great result for women's rights to land political participation, education, ending feminized poverty, enhancing economic empowerment and justice for women. Ending gender-based violence is one of the things she has really worked on, promoting equality in family relations, working often in very, very challenging contests. Now she's in Burundi and you can understand. Ms. Kem is currently UN Women Country Rep in Burundi. She came to Burundi from a leading, you know, for after leading the country office in Sudan. So you understand what I'm talking about. Before, before taking on representation responsibilities, she was a manager of the UNSG's Unite Campaign to End Violence Against Women and Girls in Africa. We can go on and on and on and on. She's with UNIFEM. She's worked with women in Cameroon. She has been a very strong advocate for women empowerment. And she has actually supported queen, the queen mothers and the kingdom, or you say the fondom of Cameroon. Queen Janet Kem, she's the queen mother of the Mogamo community in Cameroon. She is the, the people of Mogamo are from the Northwest region of Cameroon, representative of the Republic of Burundi, member of Aklin, manager of Africa Unite campaign to end violence against women and girls. My queen, my sweet lady, 
Her Royal Highness Janet Kem is going to have a conversation with Her Royal Highness Honorable Mama Ablajifa Gomashi. Your Royal Highness. Hello, Your everybody. Hello. Hello. Oh, my goodness. I wow. have. Um, I can see people I know and those I'm meeting for the first time. Greetings, mm -hmm. Professor Atlu. What a joy to see you again. Hey, Janet. Hi, Your oh, Excellency. I, I, feel, Royal Highness. Hi. <laughs> I feel so full right now. I don't know if I can eat any more of the food you're serving me today. It is <laughs> unbelievable. I, I cannot believe my luck and my blessing for having a sister such as Nanahi Maajua window, um, who through your uh, support has pulled us off. Uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, uh, I want to acknowledge um, ACLIN, the African Royal Kingdoms, the African Views Organization, Kotla, and all of you. I stand on the existing protocols, but let me say, going forward that, um, I feel as if we all know what the issues are. I feel as if we, we here understand, but I think we sometimes also assume that other people also know what we know. And because that is not the case, it is thwarting our efforts in achieving the goals that we set for ourselves. Who have gone through what I'm going, what you are putting me through. I don't suppose that they do that because they want to hurt me. It is what they have learned. We also need to figure out how to unlearn some of the things that we have learned that is detrimental to the development of women. If you are socialized to think it is okay, look at her ears. She's got no earrings that I have. And we are both queens, right? So if you're socialized to think that as a queen, you shouldn't wear earrings, why would anybody blame you if you take those decisions? So I think this is where we are, that there are people who are socialized to accept that I'm itching to hear your thoughts on what women can do, women in high level decision-making positions. What can we do to address these issues when we ourselves seem to be victims of the same society in which we are supposed to be leaders? Um, thank you very much, uh, my sisters, Nana Awindo and Nana Chifua. Thank you so much. I will start by standing on all protocols already recognized. My recognition goes to all the royalties in the room, especially our head of Kotla, our head of Aklin, our associate partners, the AV and ARC, and also all our keynote speakers. It's been a great discussion and uh, landing now on Aklin that has organized this event that has taken the lead I want to say thank you. Thank you to Her Royal Highness Queen Mother Nana. Um, yes, what role women are playing in transforming society, especially women in leadership? I think that is a very critical uh, question for us. And I speak here, um, Acts 1, that has been at the forefront of some of this transformative work to say, be it Kutla, be it Aklin, be, be it all the other organizations we're talking about, we want to recognize the critical role that women do play. And to say, first of all, embracing cultural institutions with women at the head is already transformation. It brings about transformation in everything we are doing. So the work we are doing here, the discussions we are having are very important because we're touching on issues that are core to our culture and that are core to development. Be it ending violence against women and girls, 
be it issues of education, women's health, female genital mutilation, early marriages, or we name them. So um, going by the questions that are addressed to our panel, what leadership, what kind of leadership can we bring when we ourselves are at times victims of the system? And coming to address the system, as we say, we are all in a patriarchal system and patriarchy is what we are addressing here. And being cultural leaders and women cultural leaders, I think we have the yam and the, the, the knife and the yam because having access to the cultural institutions and cultural leadership places us in a position to make a difference. So what leadership do we bring? First, I will talk of transformative leadership. Talking about transformative leadership talks about shifting the grounds. We cannot do business as usual. We cannot enter into these spheres and continue doing things as the way done. We must be able to shift ground, to move boundaries, to say no, if in the past you were doing it this way, now we can change. First, we are talking about culture. And the question I always ask is whose culture? Whose culture are we talking about? Is culture the, the, that identity for you and me as man and woman, or it is a culture for somebody? And if culture says part of it hurts a member, let's take the issue of female genital mutilation. If women says it, if women say it hurts, why should somebody think it doesn't hurt? Should culture hurt any part of its members? No. So if culture hurts, then it is culture that has to be redressed and looked into. If women say it hurt and it is hurting them, then we must listen and redress. So if culture is hurtful, if culture is discriminatory, if, if culture is biased, then it's no longer serving its people. So we should always ask before we say it's our cultural value, let's ask, ask what added value is it to us as a people? What is the value addition of violence against women? If we say it's cultural. What is the value addition of FGM? If we say it's cultural. What is the value addition of early marriage? If we say it's cultural. So once culture doesn't add value, it is no longer serviceable to its people and must be discarded. The second element of leadership that we must bring as women into this fair is visionary leadership. We must have a vision. At Aplin, I think we have a vision statement. At Scotland, we have a vision statement. So what is our vision for Africa? How are we embracing the spaces to transform Africa, to be that prosperous, united, happy continent that we all will enjoy. So we bring that vision of a prosperous, peaceful, and united Africa. And ask women at community level, what are we doing to bring these values? I heard of the fireside. I heard of the, the, the aunties room. I heard, so there's a lot of initiatives that as women in leadership, we are bringing on board to start bringing communities together. The next element of our leadership as women in cultural leadership or African women in leadership is compassionate leadership. That is one of the elements we bring to leadership that will make a difference. That compassion, that leadership with love, that leadership with harmony that we bring as women to transform the spaces that we have. And the next element for our leadership is inclusive leadership. And that is what we are telling cultural institutions that although for years past, this has been uh, the preserve of men, women are coming with this element of inclusivity. We need inclusive leadership from our cultural institutions to our state houses. Let it be inclusive so that we bring the issues of men and women on board and we all decide together. And women have that place to play to give uh, decision on what affects them. And another element of our leadership as we demonstrate in our community is the servant leadership. The woman leader at cultural level 
be it even at state level, is a servant, a servant leader. If you come to our communities, if I see the work Queen Modernana is doing in her community, the work our queen is doing in Boganda, our queen is doing in the, the, the Toro Kingdom, the work of our queen in Malawi, that is, a, that, that is servant leadership. And that is the transformation that women leaders are bringing into this institution showing that we are serving and not being served. So I think those are the changes that we bring and with values and with ingredients and the most important ingredients for us is audacity. We must be audacious, we must be daring, we must be risky because without audacity in certain kingdoms, in certain fundoms, you won't stand up as a woman to say, I am standing against female genital mutilation. But women are standing up for that. We won't stand to say we need a woman on the land commission of our community because land issues have been male dominated issues, but women are standing up and saying we need women on the land commission and they're having women on the land commission. So as women leaders, we need to come with this, this difference that would only help to build our institutions to respond to our needs and to address the issues that are affecting us as women in, uh, in Africa and around the globe. So really, I want to take this opportunity once more to salute the work that we are doing, the work that the Queen Mothers are doing, the, the, the partners that we, are, we have, especially my own organization, UN Women, that has been partnering with almost all the structures in Africa, in the regions and at country level, and to say, what I see here today is that we are coming together, building this synergy to leverage all our capacities and resources to work hand in hand to address these issues. And I think together we stand and the Ubuntu spirit, which is an African spirit, will drive us through. Thank you. I'm happy that Sir Janet also, like the, the earlier speakers, have acknowledged the fact that we have here today amazing an amazing array of brilliant people in academia in tradition in culture in politics in um, uh, public service civil society all of us I'm, I'm saying can each teach one to join us so that we have more people believing in the cause because um, my fear has been that the Perhaps it's unfounded, but my fear has been those women who are because they themselves are victims, who find themselves in leadership positions and are unable, they are unable to stand firm as we are doing here today. I am encouraged now because I see the amazing people who are, who are in this uh, uh, army of people seeking to decrease or eradicate completely gender-based violence amongst us. Interestingly also, I see that uh, on our, on our um, question, uh, uh, on our topics, um, some of the presentations have dealt with ways in which we can remove traditional impediments in the ways of women. Um, uh, and I dare say that uh, even though we have touched on them and scratched the surfaces, I'm sure that they are other ways in which we can uh, throw in our uh, um, understanding of these issues and what we can do to, to, to down or to if any of you are Raya Haider Janet, uh, if any of you, uh, Queen, Queen uh, Nagarika, um, Dr. Tulu, all, all of you, if any of you has anything that you are itching to uh, put out here for all of us to take away. I, I, I'm welcoming you now to, to bring that on board. Um, what are the kind of things that we can do to eradicate all the
gender balance that impedes the progress. Look at that with pride. But I say it with look at the amazing women on this and the background that we come from had had not created the room for us to be able to move up the ladder. Will we be blessed? How do we address who get to this position and use it all for the people? Three of you can chip it, please. Yes, may, maybe if I may, just to say, um, yeah, as yes, one sir. of the things we are doing that is helping, as um, when I listen to, to our Queen Mother from the diaspora, is to know our history. Yeah. Know who we are and pass this history down to the younger generation. And what we are doing as a, as a fondom, the, the Guzan fondom, is an institution of what we call the um, intergenerational dialogue. And I can tell you the young ones are yearning for information. They are yearning to know who we are, starting from our families to our communities, to our villages and to our country. Youth, uh, young persons are really yearning to know our history. So as the, the, the Queen Mother said, and I buy into it, fully is let's tell our story. Let's redo our narrative. Let's tell the story of the African woman, the story of the African royalty, the story of the African people. Our young people want to know the story and that is a story that will make us know who we are. It will empower us and it will build us towards the people that we really want to be. The next is really, as I said earlier, standing up to challenging some of those values that have been held for long, which are not values at all. If we don't stand up with audacity and with in, in form of dialogue, because now we are grateful that we have these spaces, we can sit together with our kings and our funds and our, the, our, our royalties to discuss. We bring dialogue on the table. And the third and the last thing I can say, there are certain practices that women are crying against today that as we heard, men went through for some time. But the same strategies that men use to stop this is what we are not tapping into. We think we heard of men who were being castrated. Eunuchs were the one uh, uh, guarding most of our policies, but they had to stop that. So if they could stop castration, why can't we stop female genital mutilation? What was the strategy that was used in stopping ca castration? We can tap into some of these. But there are still so many harmful practices that men went through, but when it came to them, it was very easy for them to decide and say, we stop it today. And once they say, we stop it, they stop it. So for women, let's go back to our royalties and say, use this used to happen with men is stop. Women are cl complaining about this, it has to stop. Thank you. Okay, let, let me follow on that. Uh, this is Professor Sheila. You say that, uh, I did say uh, research. And uh, really, for that research, I meant particularly historical research. And I'll give you an example. You know, in Botswana, we are worried about this thing of widows were back, you know, for a year or whatever. And I had the privilege of being married to a historian, uh, my late husband. So I engaged him and we had a conference with our cultural leaders. And he was able to explain to them that black was never in fact, even before the advent of cloth, we did not use any morning rituals, you know, morning for, for widows, that we got it from the Spanish and that's how we got this, you know, this black cloth that we thought, therefore, it can be one. So it, it really helped a lot because then the chief were able to say it's actually the women who insist that other women should wear this. And believe me, in more than a lot of our ethnic groups, that black has taken care of completely. For me, when I got widowed, nobody even came to me to say, do you want a black man? or whatever. No, I was left to wear my own clothes. So that really shows that we need to engage other people who are knowledgeable, especially who can tell us a little bit more about our history, how things came about, and why you know, they can be taken care of. Uh, yeah, thank you. 
Thank you so much, both. Um, we have indicated, as Dr. Sheila has just said, Dr. Sheila has just said right now, some things were done before, they're not being done today. So in that same vein, we can also um, advocate more with all our energies and find other people who believe in our cause for us to be able to harmonize culture as we want it to be. Culture as it is appreciated by all uh, both genders, not for one to be trampled upon and the other elevated. Um, I am I'm happy that you mentioned the uh, uh, widowhood. Uh, I myself recently, this last year was widowed. Uh, I lost my husband, but thankfully, thankfully, I had my sister with me. I had my sister in law who believed that I didn't have to go through a whole year of widowhood ride. So one day at a time, a step at a time, I am sure if we continue advocating, we will be able to address these issues, uh, female genital mutilation, child rights, um, widowhood rights, name them. If we continue, if we persist, we should be able to deal with it. I thank you all very much for the opportunity to speak with you. It's been a long day. I know that people are tired, is it over five hours that we've been talking? And so I'll graciously hand over to. Yes, yes, yes. Your Majesties, Your Highness, this has been really, really long. And I apologize on behalf of all of us. <laughs> and we are going to go home very soon. I know that uh, sometimes we feel that working from home is exciting, but it can be very stressful. I mean, when, when, when COVID came and we were all working from different places, we thought it was OK. And I was telling Dr. Wale this morning at dawn that the only difference between doing body meeting and this kind of meeting is flying and going to the venue. Everything else is the same. Meeting till dawn, doing that minute, it's exciting. We have a, an opportunity, even on that these very, you know, it's, we have technology to help abilities. We are going straight away to call to action. Definitely, we came here for a reason. We have heard everybody. We have put our passions on the table. We have spoken from our hearts. Where do we go from here? What are the nuggets we have put together? What do we want to do next? And how do we want to approach it? I want to call again on Dr. Wale, <laughs> the co-organizer, the director of African Views, a royal from Nigeria in Ibadan. I'm very happy to work with you, Dr. Wale. You've been amazing. And please take us off to our next steps. Thank you. Thank you so much, Your Highness. Um, I've listened so attentively to everyone and really you make uh, my heart pound because it is as was expected. Uh, we have the quality, we have the goods, and this is just a tip of the iceberg of what we are seeing today. I can't thank you enough for rising to the occasion. Um, I know there's so much to uncover, but I want to assure you that we all are on the same page. We all understand the issue. Uh, the next step is to take action. That's why it is important uh, for us to have a concerted vision and so that we can practice the Ubuntu as uh, Queen Sylvia uh, started us on earlier in this program. Um, I will say that uh, if we look at the global context, we see that we have inherited a world where men have been historically aggressive and women have been forced to be defensive. This is what we inherited. In the last few, say, 100 years, 50 years, especially in the last 20 years uh, with the Beijing uh, Declaration, we started to see a shift, take full shift. And that shift was 
a turn of the table, we see women becoming more aggressive than before. And now we see men uh, being defensive. And we have to ask ourselves, is this really the world that we want? Is this the world that we want? Constantly struggle, sword fights everywhere. Is this the world we want? Well, we've all analyzed it today. We know why this shift uh, are there. And we, we know that, especially as Africans, um, we have all that we need, really. And I wanna remind us here, we have all that we need to get what we want right within our reach. And oftentimes we forget that. We are looking on the other farm to see how greener that looks. And we're trying to covet that we are developing this avaricious attitude and behavior that has pervaded us and have hurt us so much for too long. So once we begin to look inwards, we realize that as Africans, what has been taken from us, what has been, what, what has been destroyed, why are we looking for restitutions and reparations, our, our, cultural, our cultural strength which really is the foundation of our royal heritage, of our traditional authorities. If we look at it, we're still struggling. Look at our government, our civic governments everywhere struggling. We can't figure this thing out, whether it's democracy or whatever capitalism is. We're struggling with it. Yet we inherited comprehensivism. This is what God has, God has given us from the get go. And this somehow uh, slipped through our fingers. But not all is lost. Not all is lost because our traditions are rooted in wisdom. So we have to go back to this wisdom. As Leopold Senghor said many, many, many years ago, when we are lost, we return to culture because culture is our compass. So I'm, I, I've been so happy just listening to everyone, the wisdom of our mothers, um, our sisters, our queen mothers. Uh, it's just amazing from every part. And even our fathers, you know. And, and what, we, what we learned today is that many of us uh, really, there's so much to teach. There's so much to teach. Um, and and uh, uh, Professor Sheila said it quite right. You know, and, and also uh, um, uh, uh, Lady Afla said that we, um, we, we, we need to understand that not everybody's on the same page. And there's a reason for that. So I won't belabor us too much with this analysis of philosophy and wisdom and whatnot. Let's get to the practicality of things. I wanna assure you that we have the goods. We have all that it takes. We have all that we need to get to where we want. And part of that is just digging in into our history the research, as you say, this is the reason from the get-go why an organization such as African Views was formed. And we have brought three impressive organizations together in order to deliver this program. The, um, uh, the, the uh, Network of African Queen Mothers, Aplin, um, the phenomenal instrument, okay, phenomenal instrument especially on this front of building harmony that is so necessary in our society, okay? Really uh, a recourse to sanity for us to, to understand what is at stake, the, the necessary right. piece that we need to build in order for us to even see the vision of prosperity, the vision of peace. Even today in Africa, you could have all the money you want. If you don't have peace, where do you go? See, I mean, I, you know, we know these problems. So it is important to understand uh, the importance of an organization such as Auckland, okay? And also the ARC, the African Royal Kingdom has come to force because of this very important movement. We believe that we need to connect all our royal kingdoms we need to connect them because they are like tapestries. They are like a jigsaw puzzles that they need to be placed properly 
without the confusions of the nationality and sovereignty to understand the relationship between these people and see the wisdom that we can extract from them that is useful to our people and to our growth. All of these are what has been stressed out today. So we have our own Bible to write. We have so much more. The wealth of our people is not in the ground. It's not in the diamond fields. It's not in the gold fields. It's all in our hearts. I assure you this. So the importance of reaching back to ourselves, understanding ourselves and, and building on harmony that's going to strengthen us and help us build on everything that we need to do is what is so critical. And that is what we can do. So the organization such as the ARC, the African Real Kingdom is very, very critical. It allows us to build that necessary institution of the, the, the royal, uh, uh, the African Royal uh, uh, Global, uh, the African Institute of uh, uh, Global uh, Tradition and Cultures. It allows, we need that so much where we can study and understand every aspect of uh, the minutest African kingdoms and bring all that to bear. There's so much wisdom that we can bring to the world, that we can use to serve ourselves. And this is what, as I mentioned, African views are started from the onset. That's why it is African views. This is, this is one of the things that we, we knew that we needed. As, as little as, our, as African views is, we, we have data that would nourish us for centuries to come, for generations to come. You know, we, we have this vision of how to structure the role of women in the society. And this was not generated from CEDAW, it was not generated from uh, 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 VAWA or any other. It, this is an African concept. And what we did was very simple. We just thought, Okay, all these sovereignties have constitution. What is in the constitution? What has the constitution to say about women? And when we study this constitution of every single country in the world, we were astonished to find out that every single constitution has a provision for women. To the exception of very few, very, very few, some Islamic driven countries do not have provisions for women. And there, we understood why that's the case. It's a part of the things to change. But the provisions that are in there for women are very simple. These are things that we all need to understand. These are the things that makes it necessary for men and women to work together in every single society. And the people to drive that are none other than our queen mothers. We have to go back to tradition because that's what handcuffs our sanity. That's what really breeds our psychosocial systems. That's what makes us African. That's what makes us unique. That's what makes us different. And we can get it right. So the Anti-Violence Against Women Act was based on this premise. This is called AVAWA, an acronym, A-V-A-W-A. -A. This means that we all must study our constitution and hold our government accountable for the promises made on the constitution for women. Now, who are to drive this? Again, we go back to our queen mothers because it is their role, because it is for them to understand the challenges of women in the country and it's for them to compare the plans of the government with those challenges in every single country. <coughs> it can be done. It can be done. It is an African concept. So, you know, we just need to always remember that we have all that it takes, that we have been endowed so much that we owe it not only to ourselves, but even to the world to take this leadership. <coughs> so, you know, I don't know how much time I've taken, but this is a very, very serious issue. And I've been so moved today. We work so hard day and night uh, to make sure that we bring this program uh, to bear. And we were very glad to liberally beyond CSW. Um, and uh, it's, it's been so many uh, sleepless nights, sleepless night. as you know, it was all put together in a very short notice. But I can't thank everyone enough 
uh, for rising to the occasion and understanding the importance of this, okay, and, and really bringing everything that you have to bear so that we can move the world forward. As we move ourselves forward, because it seems like the world is waiting for us. It's like, what are they still doing that back there? Yet we are the one to be in front, and we need to remember that. We need to remember that. And the beginning of that is to ensure harmony in our society, and harmony comes between the gender first, because that's where it trails yeah. to children, that's where it trails to everything else. And mm -hmm. to no one else must we hold accountable than our traditional rulers. So I call us to this, I, I call us, I call, I, I, I bring forth this call to action to please understand the concept of gender harmony and also promote the concept of Anti-Violence Against Women Act, which is very simple as said before, okay? That first, gender harmony makes it clear that the goal of the society today is not to grapple between uh, who is stronger between the gender, rather to find complements between the gender and make sure that none of the gender is hurting and that we can move together in, in, in the name of humanity and the name of sovereignty, name of nation building and all that progress that is due us. It is for this reason that we want to ensure the absolute fullest development of the female gender that's been repressed over the years that we must undo this, that, that tomorrow is too late, that yesterday was the day before and day before and day before that was the right time. So today we cannot wait a minute longer to move this agenda forward. And we want everybody to rise to that occasion. We want to promote the Anti-Violence Against Women Act to make sure that this becomes a concept for the uh, African uh, 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 women, uh, uh, African queen women uh, and women uh, cultural leaders uh, of Africa, as well as Kotla uh, 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 and all other various uh, uh, royal organizations that is in existence, that we can all come together in this agreement with the ARC concept and make sure that we have an observer status with the United Nations so that we can be first in line to understand the shift in the world. We want to be first in line for global precedence so that we can be there where it's happening so that our voices can be heard in the world, so that we can not wait to be handed the fifth line of information when it's already diluted, that we are at the forefront of things, that we are ready to grapple with our own challenges and make the best of our lives, that we make this experience of life ensuring for generations to come and make sure that gener the people before us, our ancestors who have suffered so hard, so much, so that we could have this opportunity of, of gathering today, that we can make them proud, that, that we know what they fought for, we know what they lived for and what they died for, that we can do better. So I thank you very much. Uh, we will be present and uh, we will be sure to follow up with everyone in regards to how we move forward on this. And uh, we'll talk to the, the various leaders who have been here today uh, to make sure that we have uh, a clear consensus on, on some of the uh, ideas that were brought forth today. We will uh, reach a consensus and, and structure uh, uh, our approach uh, in, in outreach and, mm -hmm. and in ensuring the society moves in the right, right direction. I thank you again so very much for this opportunity. May God bless. Thank you. God bless. Uh, God bless you. God bless you. Oh, Dr. Wale, I, I know how you feel. And I know that you are passionate to the core for, for whatever you say and whatever you do. And so I can understand. At a point, I was trying to wave you and I was trying to say, yes, we are here listening, but um, we need to wrap up. But thank you so very much. I know that it's been a long, extremely long day. Uh, those who joined us, joined us at 2 p.m. Uh, GMT, but those of us in this room got in here from 1.30. So in actual fact, if you check, uh, we've been here for four hours. In mm -hmm. fact, no, four hours, four 
hours and about 20 something minutes. It's almost four and a half hours. That's long, that's long. But I can understand that this is a very good beginning of many, many, many um, important, uh, uh, major, major networks coming together to have a discussion, a conversation on topics that are very important to us and our communities. And we understand that we need to put in our skin a bit but then by God's grace, we have brought this to a very beautiful end. And I would like to uh, call on um, our King, um, His Royal Majesty King Adedapo Aderemi to give us uh, his closing remarks. Uh, yeah. He has been I'm here throughout. He has just sent them to me. And I, I'm, yes, I noticed uh, his Please, phone I was- uh, the key points okay. that I made and she sent to me. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, um, so Queen Janet. Ah, okay. So Queen Janet, Queen Janet, yes. are you um, speaking to us? Okay. No, no, okay. no. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. So please go ahead. <laughs> okay. Uh, then please mute yourself. So because I was thinking okay. that you were talking to us. All right. So um, I can understand that our king is not on the platform at the moment. Um, so I will go ahead and call Nana uh, Anima to give us uh, the closing prayer. Um, uh, by God's grace, all the email addresses are captured in, in the uh, platform that was sending you the updates and the reminders. So we are going to work on sending further information, our call to action points, and then we would ask us all to make inputs and agree on which of these points we want to uh, take up. So Nana, uh, Her Royal Highness Nana Nima Hrenipa, she is uh, the Queen Mother of Junase. Nana Nima ascended the throne and took the responsibilities of her passing, uh, after the passing of her mother, Nana Aduma Chirikua, who was a paramount Queen Mother of Junase. She is stood as the chief Nana Aferiti Eku II. The elders and the entire Asuna Ebusunya of Boma Junase have given her their blessings and have given her also their support that her reign should go smoothly by the grace of God. Nana is also an advocate. She's a member of Akling Ghana. She's also a member of Advocacy Queens, Queen Mothers in Ghana who go out into communities to engage with community on real issues that are confronting us day in, day out. Nana Enima, if you are here, Your Majesty, uh, Your Royal Highness, please unmute yourself and give us the closing prayer. Thank you. Mama Nima Ahenepa, please. May I call on Nana Otulate? Nana, you are duly welcome to the platform. I'm trying to get Nana Ahenepa to do the closing prayer. Okay, Nana, I, the, the network was okay. very bad at my end. I think that I'm now here. Okay. Uh, can you? Okay, can, Nana Ahenepa, you, you are most welcome. Thank you. Yes, please, Nana Hunipa, we are very happy that you have been able to join us. We are uh, ready for the closing prayer at this moment so we can adjourn our Royal Majesties and Royal Highnesses. Um, I know that you were supposed to also thank us all before that. So if you can just do a brief thank you and add the prayer, then we are, we are done for the day, Your, Your Highness. Thank you. Okay, so good, e good evening to you all, respected and most distinguished chiefs, queens, ladies and gentlemen. I deem it a great honor to propose the vote of thanks for this beautiful conference. First of all, I'd like to say a very big thank you to Ackling, African Views and the ACF for organizing such a great dialogue. A hearty thanks also goes to our speakers and everyone who helped in making this a conference, a resounding success. God richly bless you all. Thank you. I would like to proceed to the um, closing prayer. Almighty God, we started this meeting with you and we are closing it with you. 
thank you for making this meeting a success. We would not have done it without you because many are our plans, but it is you who establishes them. May the things we have learned today stir our hearts and may we put them into action. May what we've learned impact our lives, families, friends, and the rest of the world positively. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. So at this amen. juncture, before we, we all depart, uh, I would wish to ask your kind permission. So everybody put your cameras on and adjust your cameras for a good shot so we can have one uh, group picture. This is a digital group picture. And um, please take off the uh, subtitles from the screen so we can, we, we can have a full screen. So Okpemi Okon, please, your camera. Yes, Professor Sheila. Yes. Ojidom Tetsua, please adjust your camera. We are seeing the window instead of your face. Ojidom, please adjust your camera. You can face the window so we can get more light to your face. Thank you very much. Okpemi. Okay, all right. We're just waiting briefly. And then the technical team, are you ready? The technical team, are you ready? The technical team, are you ready? Dr. Wale, you're off. Whilst we're waiting for them to come on, I'd like to say a big thank you to all of you our Queen Sylvia Nagenda, my Queen, thank you so very much. God bless you. Dr. Chinzera, thank you. Nana Otulate, thank you. Dr. Roger Opon Kranting, thank you. Dr. Remy Alapo, I was hoping to hear your voice, Dr. Remy. Thank you so much. We are gonna have this together again. Honorable Mama Jifa Gomashi, thank you so much. Oh, Nana. Um, Dr. Robert Impoyo for the translation. Thank you so much. My princess, Princess Dondrenini. Thank you, princess. Merci beaucoup, princess. My queen, Janet. My queen, Janet Kim. Thank you so very much. Hi. Professor Sheila Tlu. Thank Hi. you. God bless you so much. Femi, thank you. Julia, thank you so much. God bless you all. Let's take the picture. Let's take the picture. And, and, and Dr. Wally, please let us know when you're done. You are done. <laughs> thank you all so thank very much. Know. God bless you. And apologies for all the hours. Apologies, I'm sure it is worthwhile. And one day very God soon, we will have opportunity to everybody everything yes. down Thank you. and going to talk about it. God bless you. Love you all. We'll meet again very soon. God bless Thank you. you. Thank God you. Bless Thank you. you all. Thank you, Nana. See you soon. Thank you. God bless you. Nana Otilate, thanks for coming. And thank you to all our people watching on Facebook. Thank you to all others on the webinar. Bye, thank you, everybody. God bless you. Please send us um, your remarks on the Facebook page. Send us what you want us to do because we are going to take this conversation further from here. Dr. Roger, thank you so much. I can't thank you enough, Dr. Roger Cranting. Thank you. God bless you. Dr. Remy, I love you. We will meet very soon, Dr. Yes, Remy. Yes, thank you very thank much. You so much. Thank really you so much. We really appreciate your company here. Thank you. God You're bless welcome. you. God bless God you. Bless you. Bye, everybody. Dr. Bye, everybody. Boyo. Bye. Dr. Bye. Dr. Bye. Robert Merci Boyo. Bye-bye. Merci thank beaucoup. You. Princess, thank you. <laughs> Hi, thank Dr. Chinzira. Dr. Chinzira, wonderful. You. Thank, you. <laughs> thank you. Dr. Chinzira. Thank you, everyone. Mama Jifa, thank you. God yes, bless you. Mama Jifa, thank you so Bye much. Thank you all.
Thank you. Mama Jifa, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Janet, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Please, thank you, Dr. Ole. Thank, thank, thank you. We'll stay in touch. Yes, we will. Thank you so much. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good job, Your Highness. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Et à la prochaine. À la prochaine. À tout à l'heure. Bonne nuit. Merci, merci. Princess from Madagascar, thank you very much. Thank you, <laughs> merci. Oh <laughs> merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, merci. merci. So thank you all, thank you so much. Thank you. Good job. Nanaima, thank you. You're amazing. Thank you, Dr. Wale. Thank you. You're amazing. Thank you very much. At a mitzvah. Thank you, Doc. Yeah, it's a good deal. Mm. Thank you so much. Nana Nima. Nyamin Shao. Nyamin Shao. You spoke so well. Yes. yes. So, so well. Yes. Hey, my queen. <laughs> you wrote me a book. You are the best. Nana Wale. My queen. <laughs> My precious, precious. Oh, oh look at him. Look at him. <laughs> Good job. Hi, look. Prince. <laughs> Good job. Just fantastic. I'm so My I'm, prince. I'm beneath myself. We did something really good for our people today. May God let it be. Thank you. Oh, look at both of you. I should take a picture of that. That is so beautiful. Take a picture. <laughs> yeah, wait, 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 wait. Come, come, I don't see you now. Yeah, it's going off. Try to make it stable. 